You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Oral history projects are one of the most popular activities of federal court historical programs. They're an excellent way for a program to involve judges and other members of the court family in its activities. And a modest project is within the means of all but the smallest program. This video illustrates some of the unique contributions oral history can make to the history of the judicial branch. It also offers practical suggestions to court staff and members of court historical programs seeking to establish expand or improve oral history projects. There are three basic steps to establishing a court-related oral history project. First, the goal or goals of the project need to be defined. Common goals include providing biographical information about the men and women who have served on or appeared before a particular court, and offering insights into events in which the court played a central role. Defining the project's goals will help in deciding whom to interview. Second, the project must determine who will conduct its oral history interviews and what skills and experience they need. Though it may be preferable to use professional historians, a project may, for financial or other reasons, rely instead upon volunteers from the local bar association or former law clerks, for example, and provide them with a short training session on the craft of oral history. Third, the project must decide how and under what conditions to make its oral histories available to researchers. What type of releases will it need to obtain from interviewers and interviewees? What medium will it use to record the interviews it conducts? Where will it deposit interview tapes and transcripts? Will it post transcripts on the internet? These are just a few of the questions that we'll consider today. Judges are by far the most popular subjects of court-related history projects, though clerks, marshals, lawyers, and litigants are all excellent sources of information about the third branch. Senior judges, or those who serve for long periods of time, are particularly well-suited to shedding light on some of the more interesting and otherwise neglected aspects of judicial history. Consider, for example, the reflections of retired U.S. Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackmun on his drafting of the court's majority opinion in a 1971 case recognizing the right of Major League Baseball players to become free agents. Well, many times if I'm giving a speech somewhere, particularly to young people, uh, some youngster will say, is it any fun writing opinions? Have you ever had any fun? And uh, which case did you enjoy working on most? And I always say it's blood against coon because it was the baseball case, and their li eyes light up right away. They seem to know about the baseball case. And uh, I was always interested in baseball, and it gave me a chance to indulge in a sentimental journey in part one of the opinion, where I tried to uh, cover the history of baseball from the time the New York Knickerbockers played in the Elysian Fields on down to a point of some years ago, and I remember Potter Stewart calling up and he said, uh, I like that uh, history of baseball that you ha have in there, but why didn't you name Epa Rixie? <laughs> and I s said with embarrassment, didn't I name Epa Rixie? And he said, no, and you know how, what a famous uh, player he was for the Cincinnati Reds. If you will add him, I'll join your opinion. Another uh, historical oddity of that case was that Justice Arthur Goldberg argued for Kurt Flood and you were occupying his seat now at least twice removed. Do you remember anything about that argument? It presented a little bit of a problem uh, for the court. Uh, how do we address Mr. Justice Goldberg? Do we call him Mr. Justice? And if we do, is that uh, uh, an act of disfavor to the people on the other side because it gives him a title, or uh, we can't call him Arthur, although 
among ourselves, we're always on a first name basis. So I think we all ended up um, being rather neuter and spoke only of addressing him as counsel or something like this, which didn't answer anything. But um, I think it was a difficult argument for him, as it would be, I think, for anyone in arguing to a court of which he had been a member. Do you have any sense of why you were chosen to write the opinion? Only because I probably talked about too much baseball during <laughs> the discussion. <laughs> I was glad I caught it. I, uh, I never asked for it. I never asked for any case, but uh, uh, it was fun writing it. This clip gives a sense of the lighthearted negotiations that shape one part of a well-known Supreme Court opinion. It also provides an interesting aside about former Justice Goldberg's appearance before the court. This glimpse is only a brief excerpt from Justice Blackmun's oral history, however, which comprises 17 interviews totaling 38 hours. They were conducted between 1994 and 1999. As you can imagine, there is a wealth of information contained in these interviews which, in accordance with the provisions of the justice, were made available to researchers in March 2004. In today's program, three experienced practitioners of oral history, especially of federal judges, share some thoughts about the craft and about designing and executing such projects. Professor Jack Bass of the College of Charleston is a journalist turned historian. He's written several books that incorporate oral history interviews he conducted with judges who were involved in some of the great civil rights cases of the last half of the 20th century. We'll hear an interesting excerpt from Professor Bass's interview with one of those judges, Frank Johnson, who spent a quarter of a century on the U.S. District Court for the Middle District of Alabama before being elevated to the U.S. Court of Appeals in 1979. Sarah Wilson, a former Supreme Court fellow at the Federal Judicial Center, documented the experiences of women federal judges through the medium of oral history. We'll play a brief clip from one of her interviews. First, however, we'll hear from attorney Stephen Pollack, director of the D.C. Circuit Historical Society's Oral History Project. Currently, the project has completed 44 oral histories and has another 31 in progress. Here are his reflections on the Society's decision to embark upon such an ambitious undertaking. We asked ourselves, well, what does a, an oral history add to the history of a judge who's written a whole uh, volumes of opinions and who uh, speaks uh, and writes articles over the time they've been on the bench? Uh, and the answer is that the life of the judge, the form formation of the person who became the judge, is really not revealed in that body of work. Uh, the uh, operations uh, that create opinions that a judge goes through aren't known. The uh, focus on the crafting of opinions is not explicated. The views the judge may have of the court process, of the members of the bench, of the bar, of the ethics, of the changing of the practice of law, of the uh, efficiency and integrity of the administration of justice, uh, of legal ethics. Those are not explicated generally. And uh, in addition, uh, judges generally uh, don't look back on their opinions and comment on the process that led to the conclusions that they reached. As we heard in the clip from Justice Blackmun's interview, oral history can offer details about the judicial process that aren't available in the documentary record. Our experts provide their own examples of the unique contribution oral history can make. First, Let's listen to a short passage from Professor Bass's interview with Judge Johnson, whose decisions enforcing the Supreme Court's order to desegregate public schools angered segregationists in Alabama and elsewhere. The judge's comments on how public criticism affected him reveal an aspect of his personality that is not disclosed by his judicial opinions or court records. 
Then, Professor Bass recounts an anecdote evoked during his interview with another judge whose decisions furthered civil rights in the South. Judge Elbert Tuttle of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth and then Eleventh Circuit. The story adds to our understanding of the forces that helped shape judicial decision-making during an important era in U.S. history. What would you have said 10 years ago if uh, someone said, 10 years you'll be in the Alabama, what is it, the Academy of Honor? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I said, man, <laughs> you must be smoking pot. <laughs> <laughs> You suffered a great deal of abuse during that period. Well, that's not quite right. I was subjected to a great deal of abuse, <laughs> but uh, suffering, is not, <laughs> suffering is not the right word. Uh, I wasn't as vulnerable to abuse as, uh, as people that uh, social things are important to. Judge Reeves, for instance. Uh, Judge Reeves had lived here and he'd grown up here. And, uh, he was uh, a lifetime member of the Trinity Presbyterian Church, and it really hurt. It, it, it really hurt. I mean, he'd walk down the street, and his friends wouldn't speak to his lifetime friends. It hurt him when uh, he had to leave his church. I wasn't vulnerable. I was a, a kind of a hillbilly that, uh, that, that came in and, and moved in here. I've said a lot of times that uh, I'd rather be fishing uh, for speckled trout and chewing the bucker and maybe drinking a beer than being at uh, the Phantom Ball. Uh, it's, it's a matter of values. It's hard to ostracize a fellow that uh, <laughs> that uh, does his own ostracizing, and that's what it that's what it amounts to. And I didn't do that just because I was a federal judge uh, that was subjected. A lot of criticism. I did that when I practiced law. I'm the only lawyer from North Alabama that ever resigned from the Rotary Club. Judge Tuttle told this wonderful story of he was five years old and at the time his father had a job in Washington DC and he was just sitting in the house with his mother on the porch and across the, the, the street was a streetcar stop. And an African-American woman was waiting there and the first streetcar just didn't stop, just went right past her. Next streetcar came by, same thing. So his mother, without saying a word, uh, put on her hat, walked over to the streetcar, stood there beside the woman. The next streetcar stopped, the woman got on, his mother came back to the house. And it... Uh, it made a real impression on him, though. She never said a word. And I think that really helped shape his views as a judge, just that childhood experience. It helped shape his, his character, I think. The revealing stories told by the first generation of women federal judges about their job search after law school underscore how oral history can illuminate experiences that aren't contained in official records. Sarah Wilson comments on what she learned, followed by an excerpt from her 1995 interview with U.S. District Judge Ellen Burns of the District of Connecticut, who graduated from Yale Law School in 1947. Most of them had a really good time in law school and excelled academically. And it was only when they went out into the workforce and started to look for jobs in various avenues of the legal profession that gender discrimination hit them like a cold or like a cold bucket of water or or a wall of bricks and i found that interesting that they were not they didn't seem to be aware that discrimination would be a big issue while they were in law school and felt that it was pretty much a meritocratic environment but when they looked for a job the reality hit them uh, and they ended up invariably having to seek employment outside of the private legal community. When you graduated from law school, were you uh, interested in a particular area of law? or What I had wanted to be, really, was a general practitioner. Um, but I didn't find that there was very much uh, opportunity for mm -hmm. that when I was graduating from law school. Mm -hmm. Can um, you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, I, the law school, I regret to say, was not particularly helpful in finding it 
openings for you. I recall they sent me someplace that uh, didn't even have a, a position open. Hmm. Um, so it was more or less a struggle on one's own. I can even uh, remember sometime later, after I had already uh, taken my first position, that a friend of mine had asked me if I wouldn't want to be interviewed by the then uh, Attorney General of the State of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And um, I went for an interview with him. Mm -hmm. And he was very pleasant, very polite, and what he said was that he would be just delighted to have me on his staff, but he was pretty certain that the men would find it too difficult to work with a woman. And did you experience that kind of uh, treatment at private firms as well? No, le not less, uh, or I should say, not as overt as that, but uh -huh. I think it was there. And when you say that Yale was not particularly helpful, in, the law school was not particularly helpful in... Well, they had a place with in the placement. Office. Was that for all the students or... No, well, really I can't speak students? for all of the students, and I can't even speak for the other women students. Uh -huh. I can only speak from my own experience yeah. that in seeking their assistance, I didn't feel that I got very much help. Mm -hmm. But my, uh, my first job was with a special commission revising the Connecticut statute. Oral histories can also shed light on unknown aspects of the politics behind judicial nominations. I think the oral history interviews also offer important historical information about the judicial selection process. What role presidents play, what role senators play, what role members of the community play in the judicial selection process, which of course has become quite a controversial subject. And I think that uh, most of the interviews with women judges that I did uh, offer interesting stories about how it is that they got on the bench. The goal of an oral history interview is to have the subject speak as freely as possible about their life experiences and opinions on various issues. This isn't always easy. And there are particular challenges when the person being interviewed is a judge, as Sarah Wilson notes in the following comments. Then, Professor Bass discusses some techniques he's found effective. People tend to sort of freeze up if they, and sort of worry uh, if they feel that something they're saying is going to be rep recorded for posterity. With judges, that difficulty is compounded because judges obviously are restricted by ethical canons. They can't, for example, talk freely about cases they're in the middle of deciding. And therefore, I think it was extra challenging to get the judges to be spontaneous and be um, free in their recollections and under discussions of, of many of the issues. Uh, I tried to come as close to the line of propriety as I, pos as I possibly could, and found that some judges were refreshingly candid about uh, certain aspects of cases that had been decided long ago. For example, whether a particular case might have affected the support of a particular uh, group or individual for their nomination to a court in the future. I was concerned that they might not want to speak freely and yet I found, uh, somewhat to my surprise, that they were fairly candid. And one of the ways that I allayed any concerns that they might have is giving them the ability to embargo, uh, hold back from public consumption or publication, any part of their transcript of their interview. Rob Poor is important in any kind of interviews, I think, and, and so that's why it's good to ask sort of background, easy, non-threatening questions initially, just to help establish that rapport. And to learn to sit usually roughly about three feet, about a yard apart. Just if you get much closer than that, you're getting in somebody's, invading their space. I found out when people told me something I thought was less than a full answer, or perhaps a bit misleading, I'd, I would just sort of look at them and not say anything. And usually after five or ten seconds, they'd say, well, there's also this that happened or whatever. So they would begin talking. Identifying the right people to conduct, transcribe, and index the interviews, and finding the resources to pay for these services are also challenges. Hiring a historian or a professional transcription service can be an expensive proposition. Steve Pollack explains that an ambitious oral history project can be run on a minimal budget. 
our interviewers, uh, our volunteers, uh, the transcribers of the tapes that take the oral history, our uh, volunteers mostly from the law firms, um, and in the end, the out-of-pocket expenses that we're paying are primarily for the indexing of the oral histories, which we have to purchase from a professional indexer, and the binding, which uh, heretofore has been uh, provided by the uh, federal court, uh, but we are turning to uh, a hardback book-like binding, and we have to purchase that at about $10 a book. We thought uh, some about approaching persons trained uh, as historians, but uh, in the main, we had to reject that idea because we had no general access to such persons, uh, and we had no budget in uh, place, and still don't, to hire anybody. So there is a great tradition in the District of Columbia Bar of uh, lawyers volunteering their time for public service, and we've drawn on that for our uh, oral historians uh, and um, been satisfied, I think, with their performance. Anyone chosen to conduct an oral history interview should have some training in the craft. The D.C. Circuit Historical Society offers its own training sessions, which Pollock describes. We've begun the last three with about a uh, three-quarter of an hour presentation by Don Ritchie, the associate historian of the Senate History Office. Uh, Don is well-versed in taking oral histories of senators and staff. Um, and has published a book, uh, Doing Oral History, which uh, certainly anyone mounting an oral history program would want to refer to. In advance of the training session, we supply all the candidates to be interviewers with a, a booklet of uh, an outline of an oral history, of the donation instruments, of do's and don'ts, and a lot of the raw material that you could get by reading. Um, after Don Ritchie's part, uh, we've had a mock interview uh, right there in the training session with a tape running. Not every federal court oral history project will be able or want to train its own interviewers, but each must take certain steps to assure that its oral histories become part of the permanent historical record. First, it must obtain releases from interviewers and interviewees, both of whom retain rights in the tapes and transcripts until those releases are executed. Examples of releases can be downloaded from the Federal Judicial Center's website and may be tailored to the specific needs of each project. Second, each project must select a repository or repositories for the interviews once they've been edited, transcribed, and properly donated. Steve Pollack suggests that in addition to having interviewees sign releases, they should be encouraged to state their intention to donate on the interview tapes themselves. Wilson offers some thoughts on appropriate archives for oral history materials. We encourage interviewees to put on the tape early their intention to donate. Some of them express that intention and say, that there may be portions of my oral history that I would want to put under seal for a time, I will put that on the tape while doing it. And anything that I don't so indicate will be donated. That's my intention immediately on, on its completion. We have all manner of donations. Most, the vast majority, are immediately uh, donated in whole. Uh, some have a portion under seal until the death of the interviewee. Uh, some have a three-year uh, waiting period. One obvious resting place for, uh, for oral history interviews 
is a research institution located in the community that the court is in, a, a local law school, the judge's law school, for example. Uh, I believe that one, another, one obvious place uh, for transcripts of oral history interviews of a judge would be the library that accepts the judge's papers, ultimately, if that's uh, something that is ongoing. Um, I mean, if the plan is to put the judge's papers in a particular research institution, then certainly the obvious place for the, for the oral history transcript would be that same institution. To ensure the broadest possible public access, a project should consider posting its oral histories on the Internet. Wherever the interviews are archived or posted, researchers should be alerted to their existence by having them cataloged in one or more of the sources scholars normally review for such information. The primary index of oral history interviews nationally is the National Union Catalog of Manuscript Collections, maintained by the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Finally, there's this question. Should interviews be audiotaped or videotaped? Wilson and Pollock give us their thoughts. Of course, videotaping an oral history interview is another possibility, as well as tape recording. And there are some advantages. It's nice. It's, it's, I mean, basically, think about the difference between radio and television. You get additional information from actually being able to see the person. Uh, their expressions and body language and all that are interesting sources of information. The downside is cost. And I think it also, I think that uh, videotaping can chill the, uh, the interview subject, it, you know, if they're worried about the way they look or um, in addition to what they're saying, that it can be a distraction. I think it's clear that if one had one's druthers, uh, history would be best served if we videotaped the oral histories. But we have no budget for that. So uh, we audio tape them, even though it would be wonderful to see these histories on videotape. The historian wants primarily two things. The transcript, which should really reflect what the interviewee said, not a lot of editing afterwards, and a good index. The transcript of former Chief Judge Mikva runs 360 pages. Someone who wants to use the transcript, other than someone who would be writing a book on the judge, would want to dip in to the particular subjects indicated uh, in the index. So the tools for use of our oral histories are there. Uh, the videotape would be frosting on the cake. As we've learned today, it takes a small amount of money and a great deal of planning to establish and conduct an oral history project. Once the goals of the project have been defined and the subjects identified and convinced to participate, interviewers must be hired and trained and recording equipment procured. When the taping of an oral history is completed, the tapes, whether audio or video, must be transcribed and edited. Releases containing any restrictions on the interviews must be executed, and tapes and transcripts should be made available to researchers. The fruits of oral history are well worth these efforts, as this program has shown. There are a number of publications and national and regional oral history associations that can assist with the nuts and bolts of conducting an oral history project. For a list of these publications and associations, along with a collection of useful forms and agreements, please visit the FJC website. Thanks for joining us.